October 31st, 2018. <laughs> Satoru Gojo enters the Shibuya City subway station and finds himself pushed against the wall by Jogo, Hanami, and Choso. But this manages to get even worse when another cursed spirit named Mahito finally enters the Shibuya station. He's given one final choice. Sacrifice the civilians trapped alongside you who are already being slowly exercised by curses or risk it all. You've probably heard this story before, but I don't think you have within this timeline. Gojo concentrates and fires off a reversal red. While using blue for high speed movement and dashing at Maito, who just watched Jogo and Hanami get fried with curse technique reversal. What happens next is pretty obvious. Kenjaku and Maito are eventually cooked, and Shibuya City is then saved. Gojo's ceiling is one of the few real canon events within Jujutsu Kaisen, something that changes the entire world and the story itself. Kenjaku planned for months around this strategy, but there's also one backup plan that's already in place that nobody mentions. Hypothetically, if Satoru Gojo isn't sealed, then Sukuna within Itadori is their contingency plan just in case everything went wrong. This video could be interesting, but it really depends on when Kenjaku's plan fails. If Satoru Gojo doesn't hold back when fighting Jogo and Hanami, then like I've mentioned, this video is really short. That's also the same thing for about 99% of the possible outcomes that we could have seen in Shibuya where Gojo isn't actually sealed. It's incredibly short, but instead, let's make this video really interesting. Kenjaku's plan in B5 just straight up doesn't happen. Hanami getting exercised and pressed up against the wall made it clear that neither Jogo or Choso really felt safe or wanted to stay down here with this monster. Considering Gojo and Cannon already couldn't catch both opponents when trying to move between the civilians for literally an hour, Jogo and Choso might have actually escaped if they tried. Jogo doesn't think that Gojo cares as much for the civilian casualties considering that he's already tried threatening Gojo with civilians before Hanami died. This is honestly what Jogo should have been thinking when he saw that Gojo just didn't blatantly care if he fired at all those civilians. Choso clearly wasn't very interested from the start and with Jogo leaving, he'd probably follow too. My Ito and Kenjaku don't follow into the station because the original plan already went south. Shibuya City is still under siege because they need to draw out Yuji Itadori with their plan to release Sukuna because that's the backup plan. This timeline is probably the most interesting that I could come up with and you'll see exactly why, so subscribe because 99% of you guys just aren't subscribed and please like the video too. This map on screen was officially released and it does accurately point out what happened during the Shibuya incident with timestamps. I'll be using this for pretty much the entire video and shout out to my members man. Hanami is exercised by Gojo at 8.40pm and at 8.39pm Yuji made Mei and Yui Yui are at the cemetery, which is about 1.7 miles or 2.7 kilometers from the Shibuya station. Only about 10 minutes later at 8.51 pm, that same group is with Ijichi at the Tokyo Metro. Jogo and Maito completely disagree on what's best to do with Sukuna. Maito just wants Itadori gone, but Jogo wants to offer him some fingers in exchange for his help with other sorcerers. They don't care what happens as long as the curses emerge as the true humans. Releasing Sukuna is a legitimate strategy according to Jogo, and going forward within the canon, everyone is trying to to find Itadori for different reasons. Without Satoru Gojo being sealed, I don't really think that Maito is going to be as confident in having curses emerge as the true humans when Gojo is still running around. Therefore, within this timeline, I think that Maito is probably going to try to find Itadori to feed him fingers just like Jogo. When it comes to the sorcerers, everyone is originally focused on making it down to B5 because Gojo is obviously sealed, but with him free, they have no real objective outside of saving civilians. At some point, Shibuya just becomes Gojo's hunting ground for Jogo and Chosen. So, but this might be harder than you think. Hanami and Jogo completely erased their presence nearly instantly when escaping him before, so finding Jogo would be extremely difficult. Can't really say the same for Choso, who would probably be found first, but I still think he'd be found by Itadori just like the original story. Considering Itadori was on his way downstairs where Choso should be heading upstairs just 10 minutes after Hanami died, it's not so crazy to think that they would brawl just like the original timeline. Just like Choso and Jogo, Satoru Gojo would also try leaving the station to cut them off, but considering he entered by flying down, down, he probably wouldn't take the stairs like Yuji and Choso, so he would never cross their path and interfere. When realizing that finding Jogo isn't so simple like the last time he escaped with Hanami, Gojo would likely head to the giant building with the veil placed on top of it where Awasaka and Ogami were found in the original story. They needed to make the curtain stronger, so by placing the totem where it's incredibly obvious and easily seen, like on top of this giant building called Sea Tower, they can create the most efficient barrier. Because the entire game plan for Ogami and Awasaka was to place this barrier where it's incredibly obvious in exchange for greater power, that means that Gojo would probably immediately find himself there after leaving the station. After all, that's pretty much the entire 
idea with this binding vow. Just another reason why he probably wouldn't cross paths with Yuji and Choso during their fight, and it should play out just like the canon. Awasaka and Granny Ogami only really appeared because they were told that the great Satoru Gojo was already sealed away. They've been living in the shadows for around the last 20 years ever since Gojo was around 5 or 6 years old. They'll be extremely surprised when they see that Satoru Gojo himself is arriving at Sea Tower exactly where they are, and they're probably going to act extremely offensively if they're not already running for their lives. They blatantly can't win against him, and there's virtually nothing that could be done. With Granny Ogami and Awasaka entering the shadows again, Toji Zenin is never brought back. But then again, that would be interesting, so let's make one more change and say that he's revived despite Ogami needing extra time during her grandson's fight with Ino to complete the seance. Ogami makes a binding vow and gives up her own life in exchange for being able to perform the ritual in not only the most obvious place in Shibuya, but also in front of Satoru Gojo. This is kinda like the binding vow with the barrier, so I really don't think it's that crazy. Once completed, the great Toji Zenin is then brought back to life and facing off against his final opponent. Before Satoru Gojo is standing yesterday's strongest fighter, who also didn't need a single ounce of cursed energy. We've seen his heart race when reaching the conclusion that he might actually lose against Maharaga. During that moment, he thinks back to Toji Zenin standing before him just like he is right now. Something similar would probably strike again, and Gojo wouldn't hold back until something changes. He's definitely one mindless puppet of carnage, but just like against Megami, something is gonna shift. There's nothing worth fighting Gojo, and Toji Zenin doesn't work for free. Toji remembers his final moments and the regret felt pounding within his chest when he engaged in combat with nothing motivating him but pride. This would once again be deviating from his true self. Feeling that uneasiness of the strongest but even greater than before is gonna shock him down straight through his soul and he'll control himself and his body just like the original story. Toji's not actually interested in fighting Gojo and instead he wants to ask about his son Megami. Shortly after, Toji is taken out once again but he's finally resting and resolved that there's another person who's still carrying around that last name. While Gojo's occupied on that side of Shibuya and outside the station, there's also Meimei who might cross paths with Yuji and Choso unless she's found by somebody else first. Kenjaku's chosen path for leaving the station was crossing through the railways where he ended up finding Meimei. In the original story, she splits up with Yuji to rescue civilians who are trapped in exit 7 to B4, except that exit for Shibuya station is above ground and connected to the public areas of the station. These two probably wouldn't cross paths like the original story, even without Gojo's ceiling, Kenjaku was already hiding with Dagon within the railways. But even if you were to ignore that part, Yuji doesn't end up seeing Meimei in canon for at least another 24 minutes at bare minimum. And then coupled with the fact that Meimei is probably running into even more transfigured humans because they were never actually released into B5 and she would probably not cross paths with Yuji and Choso for a pretty long time. Instead of Kenjaku, she might actually encounter Maito, but this depends on how long she's down there considering that they only saw him there around the time that she meets back up with Yuji, but with the delay with more transfigured humans being around, it's a little bit more plausible. Either Meimei and Yui Yui find Maito instead of Kenjaku like the original story, or they end up being delayed and don't cross paths with Yuji for some time, but it's at least longer than 24 minutes. On the off chance that Meimei actually does end up running into Maito, then this scenario is definitely more interesting than you might think. You can't harm or damage Maito without the ability to see the soul and to be able to understand its contours. Since Yuji's body naturally inhibited two souls because he's Sukuna's vessel, his body automatically learned how to perceive two souls because his body in itself is actually two beings in one. While Meimei probably can't see the soul and therefore can't damage Maito, there's also her little brother Yui Yui. Using his curse technique, he can swap the souls of two different people and put them in entirely different bodies, and we're shown this later in the story and they use this technique explicitly for training. We're not given an official name for this technique at all, but it's the spatial transference of targets. He can transfer himself and others between his current position and his destination, and that all depends on where Yui Yui has left a marker. He's basically the Minato of JJK, but it's a little bit better because he can also switch the souls of two different people into entirely different bodies as long as he's marked them. Yui Yui can move the souls even without changing the physical body, unlike something that Maito does when he uses his curse technique, Idle Transfiguration. He describes the souls within people as presents within boxes, but Yui Yui can also change what's inside these boxes without ever opening them 
them in the first place. Not only did he understand Maito's technique when Yuji mentioned Maito verbatim and directly, but he clearly can already target the soul since that's the basis for his switch training because it's a requirement for his teleportation. Besides Yuji, he's probably the only person at Jujutsu High who can actually do some damage to Maito. However, considering Meimei and Yui Yui's power scaling, they definitely aren't ready to face somebody like Maito. Meimei is a grade 1, but Yuji himself is recommended by Toto and Meimei to be a grade 1 sorcerer, so he's definitely already fighting on a grade 1 level. Meimei herself also compares Yuji directly to Kusakabe, who Meimei herself says is the strongest grade 1. So when you really get down to it, what Meimei is really saying is that Yuji is already around Kusakabe level at the very beginning of Shibuya, and Kusakabe is above Meimei by Meimei's own admission. Yuji obviously later in Shibuya is fighting Maito, and both of them are very comparable and pretty much neck and neck. This version of Yuji that I'm talking about not only ate more Sukuna's fingers, which Gojo confirmed does raise his power, but also happened after Sukuna's takeover. Each time this happens and Sukuna undergoes another full manifestation, there's more experience being overlaid onto Yuji's body. This muscle memory is exactly why Yuji began growing so rapidly, and it's because Yuji's body already had that special great experience. Sukuna used pretty much everything within his arsenal from Cleave to Malevolent Shrine. Overall, this version of Yuji is probably much stronger than earlier, who's arguably at bare minimum Meimei level if you don't think the gap between herself and Kusakabe is really that big. Just like in the original canon story, Meimei and Yui Yui are gonna disappear to Malaysia and they're gonna use Yui Yui's teleportation curse technique and Maito ends up surviving and moving forward in Shibuya. With Yuji being the only person left from that squad and eventually beaten by Choso, he's left her defeated just like the original timeline. This fight should also be quicker in this timeline considering that there's no point where Yuji becomes stronger when focusing on saving Gojo from B5 because that obviously happens because he's motivated by Gojo being sealed and trapped within the prison realm, which obviously doesn't happen. Yuji had to resign himself to death just so that way everybody can make it down to B5 to save Satoru Gojo, trusting that when that happens, everybody is going to be okay because Gojo is going to be free. Without that mentality to power himself up, Yuji is either going to have to find some other motivation or the fight ends quicker than before. You're free to comment below on whatever you think, but make sure to like the video. Naobito's team with Maki and Nanami would never have headed down and found Dagon. More than likely, he would continue remaining with Kenjaku and Maito. Awasaka never fights Megami alongside Yuji and Granny Ogami, and they never end up facing Ino. They'll likely remain above ground not knowing anything about what's going on underground, and if Jogo is smart, he probably wouldn't even exit the station knowing that Gojo is above ground, and that's exactly how he spotted Hanami at Goodwill when he was flying in the air. But even without the info of what happened exactly during the Goodwill event, leaving the station still doesn't really make sense because he's trying his best to avoid being seen. He says in the main timeline that Yuji's friends are all over Shibuya, so he definitely knows that there's sorcerers everywhere. Just like Kenjaku, it doesn't make sense for Jogo to attempt leaving the station, unlike what Gojo's probably thinking, who's anyways occupied at Sea Tower. We don't know how exactly Mimiko and Nanako find Itadori within this timeline to feed him the Sukuna fingers. We know for a fact that they weren't in B5 during Jogo and Hanami's fight with Gojo because they weren't hit with the Unlimited Void. However, we know for a fact that they are nearby because they do come down to B5 later and they said that they're doing work for Kenjaku. They'll eventually head down to see what's going on and then they'll also probably head back upstairs which is where they find Itadori in the same spot as before. They definitely do go down to B5 at some point because we just see that blatantly happen in the main timeline, so either they're gonna find Itadori when they're going downstairs or if they're downstairs already, they're gonna find Itadori on their way back up. However, within this timeline, things are already happening very differently in a way that matters directly directly to Mimiko and Nanako. Kenjaku is never given that opportunity to break the deal that he made between them. Kenjaku ended up making a promise with them, but it wasn't a binding vow. They made an agreement that if they end up doing what Kenjaku wants, then he would give up Ghetto's body, which obviously he didn't do, so Mimiko and Nanako don't trust Kenjaku. But considering in this timeline they still trust Kenjaku somewhat, they have no real reason to use Sukuna to kill Kenjaku. However, if they end up just walking past Yuji, then I guess it just makes sense for them to attempt to use their plan with Sukuna like the original timeline. I don't think they would just pass up the opportunity to use Sukuna to get what they want because at the end of the day, what they want is Kenjaku to give up Ghetto's body and using Sukuna only raises their chances of actually succeeding. This is just the better option for guaranteeing what they want, so why pass up the opportunity? Either they'll bring Kenjaku once finding Itadori's body if they really do trust him or they'll just immediately start feeding him Sukuna's fingers. Returning Sukuna to his full power can only really benefit Kenjaku further. If Mimiko and Nanako do trust Kenjaku, enough, they'll bring Kenjaku. Otherwise, they're just gonna feed him the fingers on their own, and regardless, the result is clearly the same. There is that chance that Gojo will interrupt them while they are actually reviving Sukuna. After feeding Yuji one finger, Jogo had felt his presence.
presence. Megami and Toji also felt him nearby, but it's unclear at what point in the process this happened. We know that that presence that Jogo was feeling was just Sukuna's fingers, but when it comes to Toji and Megami, we don't know if they're feeling Sukuna's fingers or Sukuna himself. The closer you are with someone else, the stronger you're gonna sense their presence. This is blatantly shown when Megami crosses paths with Yuji in the very first chapter of JJK and when Yuta arrives when seeing Naoya, Yuji, and Choso. Depending on the actual distance between Gojo and wherever Sukuna is being incarnated, there's the chance that he might not feel Sukuna's presence until he's actually incarnated and not just one finger. If you remember back to chapter 2 during Gojo's introduction, he only arrives after Sukuna incarnates despite the finger's presence being felt all around the school and by those nearby like Itadori. Now when talking about Satoru Gojo specifically because he has the six eyes, this depends on a couple of factors that we don't really know because it's kinda strange. Gojo as a kid, when he's only about 5 years old, is able to sense Toji standing behind him despite Toji literally calling himself the invisible man because he doesn't have an ounce of cursed energy. We're not given any direct explanation period, but it really just comes down to two potential choices. Gojo teleports in and saves Yuji and nearly instantly exercises Jogo and Sukuna doesn't get unsealed. Now the other choice would be that I finally get to talk about the most exciting part of this video. Regardless if Mimiko and Nanako actually do show Kenjaku Itadori, he'd probably not stick around considering that Sukuna's presence would be extremely alarming and that he's trying his best to remain hidden. After Gojo shows up late after Sukuna is already incarnated just like their first encounter, Ryomen Sukuna emerges and incarnates but with 15 fingers worth of his original power and stands before the strongest. However, despite Sukuna only being at 15 fingers worth of his original power and not 20, he's also not the one here who's at a disadvantage. You gotta remember that Shibuya is still crawling with people. Yuji doesn't fight the Grasshopper or Kogai in this timeline, so the curtain might still be up. Some people might still be trapped in Shibuya, but regardless, the city is massive and crawling with not just sorcerers, but also Gojo's allies. Those who are still above ground like Naobito and Megami are quickly gonna realize that the massive presence in Shibuya is Sukuna fully awakened and currently brawling with Satoru Gojo. Kusakabe is gonna try his best to clear the area because he doesn't want them to be crushed by the giant elephant special grades like Gojo and Sukuna because to them, they're all nothing but just ants. It's also exactly what he does in the original JJK, so it's pretty consistent. But regardless, it's true that moving this many people when the barrier might have only dropped just minutes ago is nearly impossible. The power difference isn't really the biggest part because while Gojo should have an advantage when it comes to stats, he's gonna be forced into fighting with a playstyle that's more defensively because he needs to move Sukuna somewhere else that isn't Shibuya, but he can't use large-scale attacks like blue or red. Sukuna's incarnation happens within the station, and if they haven't gotten rid of the veil or the curtain, they're still non-sorcerers trapped inside. Gojo can't bring Sukuna lower into the station, and the risk of entering above ground becomes too high. With some of the non-sorcerers already being exercised earlier, that means that Gojo is only closer to his breaking point. There's also the factor of Sukuna being within Itadori's body. Gojo had done special training before Shinjuku, so that way he felt comfortable beating on his own student. This only worked because Gojo literally pictured Sukuna as Toji because Megami and Toji just do look alike because they're father and son. Gojo not only had the time to get comfortable with this strategy, but he also can't picture Yuji as anybody that he would be comfortable beating on. Maybe it wouldn't affect Gojo as bad because he is obviously closer with Megami and he did have the time to mentally prepare that one day he would be taking on Sukuna, but he clearly does care about Yuji even later on. I'm just saying it might be a bit of a problem. This situation clearly isn't ideal for Satoru Gojo with multiple negatives all around and his only advantage being the fact that he has infinity. This means Sukuna is going to be using domain amplification just like the beginning of Shinjuku. However, this also means that his curse technique shrine can't be used effectively. I've said that larger attacks can't be used and that's totally true. Hollow purple outputs way too much cursed energy and would easily eliminate tons of civilians and potentially sorcerers. Same thing with reversal red which outputs twice as much cursed energy as curse technique lapse blue which also can't be used effectively. It's hard imagining a scenario and an outcome where civilians aren't harmed especially considering where Sukuna is going to be incarnating. However Gojo has one key advantage and it's through his six eyes. Shoko says that Gojo can know just by looking at somebody what would happen if his domain infinite void ended up clashing with just about anybody. Gojo said that it depends on several factors, like which domain happens to be more polished, but it can also come down to the user's compatibility and cursed energy, which are also things that he can probably view through his six eyes. You might be thinking that we don't know exactly what can determine the end result of two domain expansions clashing against each other, and technically you're right, but Sukuna's Malevolent Shrine clashed evenly with Unlimited Void at 20 fingers worth of his original power. Regardless of how much strength you think is within each finger, the outcome is clearly obvious. With them being evenly
evenly matched, that would also mean that anything less would make the clash in the other's favor. But there's still that problem with Gojo not being able to make his domain expansion in B5 because there's people everywhere and all the floors that are beneath and above them are filled with people. This puts Gojo in the same corner that we see him in in the original story. The only reason why this timeline is more problematic is because Gojo is fighting Ryom and Sukuna. Sukuna won't wait before dumping more humans into the fry like Jogo and Maito. He's outright not gonna care at all for all the people that are stuck in B5. This would more than likely push Gojo closer to that brink that we already saw within the main story. The only thing left for Gojo to really do is concentrate. Casting Unlimited Void presents multiple problems just like the main timeline. That deadly sure hit will turn every non-sorcerer into a vegetable within seconds. He could try avoiding completely placing those non-sorcerers within his barrier, but they would also likely be crushed between the structure of the densely packed station. There's only one real choice left to make, and we've already seen it happen. Gojo raised his hand and cast Unlimited Void for about 0.2 seconds, while Sukuna also raised his hand after feeling the spark of cursed energy. However, the activation time for Sukuna is also problematic, just like the two domains clashing. They were evenly matched in Shinjuku, so it's impossible to say that Sukuna can still keep up with that speed when he's not at 20 fingers worth of his original power. Sukuna, while he was faster and stronger, was still clashing evenly with Gojo and expanding his domain at the same time. Anything less would result in him losing the clash, either before he can even cast his domain or during the clash itself it would be suppressed by Unlimited Void. Ending with Sukuna eventually losing control of Itadori's body, with everybody in the station being hit with the Unlimited Void. Kenjaku within this timeline would have no reason to stick around, and it's the same with Maito, Dagon, and Jogo if he wasn't trapped within the Unlimited Void where he's inevitably exercised, leaving the creator of the Cullen games alive and ready to continue moving forward for a part 2. This is the first what if story I've ever done, and I tried making it as cohesive as possible and really tried to make as much sense of it as I could, but I might have made a little bit of assumptions here and there, but for the main stuff I'm pretty sure I explained it pretty well. I don't normally do outros, but please let me know what you guys think because I do look over every single comment eventually, especially if I'm planning on doing a part two.